Hi, everyone. I'm Richard Dolan. This is my wife, Tracy. Hi, everybody. And welcome to Intelligent Disclosure. Um, how long have we been doing this? It's a good question. A couple of months. I think so. We started yeah. in, uh, our first one was actually in Whistler. That's right. British Columbia, yeah. that had to be around uh, early July. Uh -huh. So we're now in the middle of September. We haven't missed a week doing this. Nope. So we've actually been doing this about two and a half months. Wow. Not bad. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's been fun. And I think we're going to be doing this for a while. Definitely thanks to uh, our friends, Lori and Michael, for yes. making this happen, too. So for tonight, um, I want to get into the death of one of the most fascinating historical figures of the 20th century, that is uh, uh, James Forrestal. I'll tell you all about Forrestal. Uh, before we do that, was there anything you wanted to mention? Or uh, Well, how about something I can't get out of my head? We watched that movie last oh. night, uh, Jeremy Corbell's documentary on the Skinwalker Ranch. Yes, yes, yes. Hunt for the Skinwalker. I interviewed Jeremy on my uh, the Richard Olin show uh, for KGRA. That's going to be on YouTube any day now. And Jeremy is a documentary filmmaker who did a, the film on the Skinwalker Ranch in Northeastern Utah, yeah. book of the same name from 2005. What were your thoughts? Uh, I couldn't sleep last night. Other than that. <laughs> oh no, it was, it's uh, very, I, yeah. I think it's a really important documentary for people to see. And um, it definitely, definitely validates that there is something going on out there that is unexplainable. It, you know, it's, there's the UFO element, but there's also sort of the, paranormal, unexplained, high strangeness element. And uh, I just think it's amazing that they got to dig back into these old, this old investigation where they had all of these uh, VHS tapes. Yeah, um, this was George Knapp doing this 20 years ago. And we should come back and do our own little take on that, don't you think? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, like our reaction to it. Other than creepy. Yeah, it, it was very, what the main takeaway that you get from this, and by the way, the book is excellent. It's been out for many years now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for skeptical people who say there's nothing to this, it's just like, a, you know, they're just doing a Blair Witch Project. No, wrong. This is a serious investigation uh, that I think has really very strongly demonstrated a, um, um, an intelligence at this ranch in Northeastern Utah that manifests itself in a variety of ways that are very deeply unsettling. And maybe we could just leave it at that. And Yeah, there's so many things we could say about it, yeah. but we should save that for you to uh, watch it. It was very well done. And uh, Right. You can find it on iTunes. We're, we're going to give a shameless plug. Jeremy's my friend. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know Jeremy? Did you meet him? I have. We have met, yeah. Met yeah. Um, and uh, it's outstanding. You can find it on iTunes. So what else? Well, we just got back from the Transhumanism Conference in Branson, Missouri. We should that talk was about that. Very sometime. interesting. Maybe we won't talk about that tonight, but uh, oh, that was a fascinating conference. No, it was. We did a, a transhumanism chat on this uh, live stream a couple of weeks ago, I think. Mm -hmm. So we, we have sort of explored it. Um, we can come back to it. I mean, transhumanism is one of those things that just is not going to go away. It's mm -hmm. here, It's uh, and it's going to be a very, very unsettling world in the future, our opinion. Yeah, I think it would be fun, uh, will be a good idea to talk about Hugo's speech. Uh, what was, Hugo de Yeah, Dr. Dr. Hugo, Hugo de mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, that's something that we could talk about because uh, yeah. that was very powerful. The coming war with the Artelex, as he calls them, that's yes. artificial intelligences, or intellects. Okay, I think that's it. Do you want to jump right in and I'll, so, uh, yeah. I'll come back in a little bit. So yes, my dear. I'll see you shortly. You're gonna go away over I the yonder? I love this story. Uh, that he's about to tell. So. Love in a in a yeah. in a creepy campfire way. Yes, yes, exactly. Because it's it's a sad story. It's a tragic story, in many many ways. And um, so, anyway, I want to talk about James Forrestal. Just as a as a side note, Forrestal was one of my personal entry points into the UFO field way back in the early 1990s. Um, just as I was exploring the UFO subject for the first time about 25 years ago. Uh, I was doing a great deal of uh, private independent study of James Forrestal. And so, you know, it was just an interesting kind of emotional kind of connection for me. My entry point into the UFO subject, which focused on the late 1940s, that was Forrestal's time. That's when Forrestal died. Um, I had been studying Forrestal for a tremendous uh, amount of time before that. 
And then I learned over time that there are some genuine reasons to connect Forrestal to the UFO phenomenon and also to look into the very strange elements of his death. Uh, but a little bit of background first. So James Forrestal was America's first Secretary of Defense. He took office in that role in September 1947 at a time when what was known as the Cold War was heating up. Uh, this is, you know, the serious rivalry, dangerous rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union. What was the Soviet Union for you younger people? You may have forgotten or may never have known. Never be surprised at what people forget or don't know is my basic rule here. But the Soviet Union, of course, was, was Russia. It was the massive multinational communist empire dominated by Russia. Um, and so the early, late 1940s is when that rivalry was really, really getting some serious momentum. And James Forrestal was part of this story. And he was really one of a kind in many ways. Uh, Forrestal was a Princeton man. He played football for his university as a young guy. He had movie star good looks, and he was a guy who knew how to make money during the stock market boom of the 1920s, and he knew how to keep his money during the depression of the 1930s. Um, Forrestal was known as a guy who could get things done. He was very smart, no nonsense, but he was also someone who was very charming, and gracious and just one of those people that everyone wanted to be around. Women, men, that was James Forrestal. In fact, he sometimes has been described as a, a real life Jay Gatsby, uh, the character from the great novel by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, during the Second World War, Forrestal became one of President Roosevelt's uh, so-called dollar a year men. These were men from the very highest levels of America's power structure. Uh, they came to work for the government to help win the war. And they didn't do it for the money. That they, they didn't need the money. So their salary was $1 a year. That was, Forrestal was one of those. And um, I, I should add that Forrestal didn't de just do this job as a status thing. Uh, he came in as assistant secretary of the Navy. So a very, very important role. And he developed a stellar reputation in that role. So he was number two man in the US Navy during most of World War II. By the time the war was over, he had become secretary of the Navy and he was riding high. Uh, that's 1945. And so then two years after the war ended in 1947, James Forrestal went from being secretary of the Navy to the newly created position of secretary of defense. And this is all due to the massive reorganization of the U.S. government. It was known as the National Security Act of 1947. This was probably the single biggest reorg the U.S. government's ever had. It was huge. Uh, it created the CIA. It created uh, an independent air force. It created a National Security Council to advise the president on matters of great importance. And it changed the old uh, Department of War to Department of Defense. And it gave the Secretary of Defense leadership over the Army uh, over the Navy, the Marines, Air Force, over all of America's armed forces. So yeah, you would think that James Forrestal was at the pinnacle of an amazing career in government when he got that position in September of 1947. Well, it's very interesting because less than two years after James Forrestal took office as America's first Secretary of Defense, his life ended in a 16 floor leap or fall out of the Bethesda Naval Hospital in Maryland, not far from Washington, DC. And just take a moment and pause and think about how very, very extraordinary and odd, how unusual and odd that is. So how that happened is what I wanna talk to you. I've written about Forrestal before. Uh, by now, I think lots of people have written about him and talked about him uh, and about his death in particular. For nearly 70 years since it's been, the decline and death of James Forrestal still remains one of the really true unresolved problems of history. Um, so we know that Forrestal suffered from some kind of spectacular mental breakdown 
through 1948 and 1949. And no one is disputing this. Now, the reasons, now that's where things get interesting. So I'll just mention, so throughout 1948, um, you know, the whole Secretary of Defense establishment was, was a new thing. And here's Forrestal trying to manage this entire new department. And uh, there was a kind of uh, unfortunate irony in his position. Uh, when the Secretary of Defense office was being established uh, in 1947, Forrestal was still Secretary of the Navy, and he lobbied really, really hard for having the Secretary of Defense position be what we'd call a weak, a weak Secretary of Defense, and that is someone who would not have authority to force the armed services uh, to accept budget proposals from the president. In other words, um, you know, the Navy particularly was always fiercely, fanatically independent and didn't want any other office uh, bossing them around. And so Forrestal actually very successfully as Secretary of the Navy got the role of SecDef to be a weak Secretary of Defense. And then to his chagrin, he gets to be the first guy to be Secretary of Defense. Now his job is to corral all of these uh, very um, pride, uh, proud services that that um, did not have to accept budgetary recommendations. This is really important because in 1948 and 1949, as I mentioned, the Cold War was heating up. President Harry Truman wanted to radically expand America's military presence throughout the world. And guess what? All that costs a lot of money. And if you can imagine, America's military budget at that time was $15 billion. Now, even in 1948, that's not a whole lot of money to do the kinds of things that Truman wanted the military to do. The arms, uh, the arms service, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, excuse me, was fighting really hard at this time for at least double that amount, like $30 billion. And Truman's like, no way. Uh, he actually was serious about trying to have a balanced budget. Really amazing. So here's Forrestal, who secretly, not so secretly, sided with the Joint Chiefs of Staff on the budget matters, but had to enforce Truman's opinion, but wasn't really able to get the uh, 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 separate services to agree and to go along. And, and it was a really tough uh, ride for him. So it, I think it's fair to say he lost a lot of political capital during 1948 as a result of that. And we're not even getting to UFOs yet. So this was a real problem that Forrestal had. Um, one of the main enemies Forrestal developed throughout 1948 was the secretary of the Air Force, a man named Stuart, uh, Stuart Symington. Uh, they really locked horns. They were really at war with each other, you could say. So. Um, as a result of all this, Truman really began to start losing confidence in Forrestal. Um, now, here's the other part of it. Throughout 1948, Forrestal may not really have cared a whole lot about that <clears throat> because by the middle of 1948, pretty much everyone in the United States assumed that Harry Truman's political career was over and that he would not be elected president in November. And, you know, keep in mind, Truman had not one election as president. He, he became president when Franklin Delano Roosevelt died in April of 1945. So Truman had just been this nobody vice president coming really out of nowhere to become vice president. Roosevelt dies, Truman becomes president. No one respects this guy, this senator from Missouri, Harry Truman. And he was just kind of like a placeholder, people thought. And then there were economic issues in 1948. There was all these other things happening. Truman was not considered to be popular and really was considered to be on his way out. Uh, the Republican nominee, Thomas Dewey, was really widely expected by everyone to win election. So from Forrestal's point of view, ah, Truman wasn't happy with him. Maybe it wasn't such a big deal. But it wasn't Truman who was the doomed man. It was Forrestal. Um, first, his relationship with Air Force Secretary Symington went from bad to worse. Uh, Symington seems to have had a 
a lot of journalists that were working with him, at least that's what it seems like to me, who they embarked on this kind of guerrilla warfare against Forrestal. I mean, really like slander, smears, innuendo. He used uh, uh, two famous journalists of the day, Drew Pearson and Walter Winchell, and both of them just went after Forrestal. Uh, Symington seems to have been behind a lot of it. So that was one thing for Forrestal. Then throughout the fall and winter of 1948, during the election season, uh, everyone started noticing like Forrestal's mental health, his physical condition were not the same. He started developing this uh, weird habit in meetings. People started noticing of, of, of dipping his his fingers into glasses, a glass of water and, and wetting his lips on a, like a regular basis. And people are like, what, what is this all about? Um, and he t- started talking about being um, followed by foreign looking men, as he used to put it, like being followed by basically men in black, you might say, or, or by not necessarily men in black as we've come to understand them, but strange people following him. Some people said, he is just being paranoid. Others, uh, you know, wondered maybe Forrestal was telling the truth. James Forrestal, it's not that he just completely collapsed during this time. He was clearly under some stress. Yeah, I think we can agree. The question is, how far did he really go? Was he accurately perceiving the reality around him? I think the answer seems to be yes. Like he was under attack in the media. He was under attack in the defense establishment. All that is true. Keep in mind, in 1947 and 1948, despite the fact that all of this was kept really out of official analysis of the Truman administration, is the fact that the UFO phenomenon fell into the laps of the Truman administration. And this is a fact. And it is also a fact that this was a phenomenon from everything that we can see, got a great deal of attention and a high level of concern. And we definitely know that Forrestal was apprised of what was going on in the UFO phenomenon. We know that in the summer of 1948, when all of the uh, shenanigans and infighting were happening, that President Harry Truman uh, started receiving quarterly briefings on UFOs coordinated by the Air Force and CIA. So, and this is something that did not come out until many, many, many years later in the 1970s. And even then, hardly anyone knew. Uh, I was in a little uh, interview with the Air Force Colonel, later general, who interviewed Truman. No No one really knew about this, but it was happening. So this was a very important thing. So UFOs were on people's mind. And it is in this context that Forrestal is convinced that the uh, that someone is spying on him. So there's all of this. Uh, there were people in the Truman White House who believed that or decided that Forrester was suffering from some kind of psychotic breakdown, but th- there's no medical consensus about that whatsoever. So then Truman wins the election in November of 1948. I mean, to everybody's shock. And there's a famous photograph, if you are not familiar with this, you should Google it sometime, uh, where Harry Truman, a jubilant, victorious Harry Truman, uh, right after the shock of him winning the election, is holding out a newspaper that has the headline, uh, Dewey defeats Truman. And, you know, wrong. That's pretty much like when uh, Newsweek put out the uh, uh, Madam President cover for Hillary Clinton they did the same thing. Uh, so anyway, Truman wins the election and Forrestal's now like, okay, he's waiting for the shoe to drop here. And indeed, in early 1949, January 11th, 1949, Truman brings Forrestal into his office and says, okay, you're out. I'm replacing you as Secretary of Defense. Your services will no longer be required. Um, and at this, by this point, I mean, the amount of media attention on Forrestal was actually really intense. It was like this media war going on. Sound familiar? Uh, there's always one happening, isn't there? And it was happening in 1948, 49. Uh, so you've got Symington and also, uh, the attorney general, 
a guy named Tom Clark, are feeding stories to Drew Pearson and to Walter Winchell. Uh, in particular, like that Forrestal is complaining about being followed by Zionist agents. So they bring in the whole Israeli connection. Uh, and Forrestal got mad and his, in turn, uh, he accused uh, Tom Clark of the, uh, the attorney general of having the FBI shadow him. Clark denied this, but it could totally, completely have been true. Um, so anyway, all of that's behind the scenes, more or less. And then at the end of March, on March 28, 1949, public appearances are totally different. Uh, Truman organizes this <clears throat> wonderful, beautiful ceremony for Forrestal. Uh, you know how this goes. You've given us great service. We love you. We appreciate the work you've done. You're a great American hero. Yada, yada, yada get the hell out. <laughs> That's essentially what happened. Uh, so now, now it gets interesting. And actually the, the truth was Forrest so apparently got very emotional at the ceremony. He was very touched. Uh, I think Truman, look, politically they had become enemies, Forrest and Truman. But the thing is, um, I think a lot of these guys realize, look, it's just politics, nothing personal. Like when someone on the Sopranos, you know, whacks someone else says, Hey, nothing. They're just personal. <laughs> Sorry. And I think that's what happened with Forrestal. So now it get, becomes interesting. What happened after this ceremony, March 28, 1949, this is still a mystery. I have a feeling this will always be a mystery. What we know is that the Air Force Secretary, Stuart Symington, perhaps Forrestal's number one enemy, says to Forrestal privately, he says, there's something I would like to talk to you about. And they go back together in the limo ride back to the Pentagon, to Forrestal's office. We do not know what Stuart Symington said to Forrestal, or, or maybe did, because the fact is Forrestal gets out of, out of his ride, out of the limo, deeply upset. I mean, maybe even traumatized gets to his office, um, and he is just not the same person. There were friends of Forrestal later said, or at least implied, that Symington said something that shattered Forrestal's last bit of psychological defense there. The point is, the fact is that when Forrestal goes into his office, you know, closes the door, and he's in there for a while, Someone finally goes into Forrestal's office. We're talking several hours later. They walk in. He doesn't notice. He's just staring rigidly at his desk, looking straight ahead at a, at a bare wall. And he's repeating one sentence. You are a loyal fellow. You are a loyal fellow. Over and over. Like, just again, this is another of these moments where you just have to pause and ask yourself, what is going on here? What is happening? So, Farsal, like people make a few phone calls, and it's obvious that James Farsal is not well. So, it's arranged for someone to take him home. Um, but within one day, the Air Force flies him somewhere. The Air Force to Hope Sound, Florida. This is the home of a friend of his, uh, Robert Lovett, uh, Bob Lovett, who, was be who himself became a future uh, Secretary of Defense a few years later. Forrestal's first words to Lovett were, Bob, they're after me. So you already see very clearly Forrestal is really seriously worried about his life and he's worried about his career and he's worried about everything because he now feels that he is, he's under attack. So they fly in someone named William Menager, uh, a doctor, who is head of what was the Menager Foundation. William Menager was a, a very high level, uh, famous uh, psychiatrist of the time. And they also uh, flew in an army uh, captain, a, a man named George Raines, um, excuse me, not an army captain, Navy captain, my, my mistake, 
Uh, in fact, Rames was a chief psychologist of the of the Naval Hospital at Bethesda, Maryland. So you've got Menninger, you've got Rames here. Now, Forrestal's time in Florida uh, was only a couple of days, and it's not really 100% clear what happened there. You've got different accounts. One account came from the journalist Drew Pearson, which I wouldn't really put a lot of uh, credibility in. Uh, it sounds like a smear to me, but was Pearson claimed that Forrestal had several hysterical episodes uh, that he had made at least one suicide attempt, uh, that he was certain of an of an imminent invasion, that the communists were having an, were going to have a, an invasion any time. Now you know, years later, that kind of changed into the meme of Forrestal being concerned that aliens we're going to invade. And the thing is, you know, no one is going to write in 1949 that Forrestal was concerned of an alien invasion, obviously. Um, and we, we really will never know what Forrestal was, um, you know, what, if, if anything specific, he was worried about in terms of an invasion, because I think this is all hearsay. But the fact is, Forrestal knew about the UFO phenomenon just as much as he knew about the, the communists. And the fact is, it could have been either. There was a great deal of hysteria, concern that the Russians were planning some kind of global takeover. This was, you know, then as now, you get this kind of ramped up hysteria over uh, Russian aggression. And, and it was exactly the case in 1948 and 1949. Anyway, we don't really know. This is what Drew Pearson wrote. Um, it's also true, however, that Dr. Menninger explicitly denied that Forrestal had, had attempted suicide while he was in Florida. Uh, according to Menninger, Flor Forrestal did tell him that the day before he, a Menninger arrived, that Forrestal had supposedly placed a belt around his neck, uh, intending to hang himself, but the belt broke. That doesn't seem very credible. To me, belts don't break that easily. And in, in manager's opinion, it didn't seem realistic either. There were no marks that he could find on Forrestal's neck or on Forrestal's body, and no one found any broken belts. So manager's opinion was that this was some kind of fantasy or nightmare or whatever. In any case, Forrestal was only in Florida for maybe uh, three days or so. On April 2nd, 1949, uh, he's flown back up to Maryland, to Bethesda, and they said this is for security reasons. You got to ask yourself, what security reasons do you really need to take Forrestal back up into the, the belly of the beast, so to speak, into right at Washington, D.C., essentially, Bethesda, Maryland? Why? What security reasons? It's very, very interesting. So this is all April 2nd. This is just a few days after Forrestal's, um, you know, the ceremony that Truman had had for him. This is all really very, very rapidly uh, happening, this, this kind of uh, breakdown, or is it a breakdown? We really have to ask ourselves, is it really a breakdown? Because what it looks like to me at this point, all that I can see is that Forrestal is pushed out of office, so to speak, shoved out of office, um, something messes him up and the entire national security establishment panics and they get him and they fly him far away. Why do they fly him far away, incidentally? Like that's never explained. No one ever, not in any of the biographies of Forrest Soul that I've read, read a few or any of the articles, like why did he go to Florida? Why was he taken down there to begin with? It's very, very interesting. And then they fly him back to Bethesda, Maryland. Like for someone who's in a highly uh, nervous mental state, supposedly, they, they're flying him like almost a thousand miles one way, a thousand miles back. Uh, that itself is jarring. It could be. Anyway, so they do all of this. Now, he's back in D.C. They're, they're driving now from the airfield to the hospital, right? And we pretty much know this, this has been confirmed, that Forrestal made several attempts to leave the vehicle while it was in motion. Again, stop and think about this. 
how seriously terrified must this guy have been to try several times to get the hell out of the car while they're driving him to the hospital. That's serious fear. Forrestal, again, really this must be said, was a guy who his entire life was a man who was on top of the game all the time. You know, he was the guy that everyone loved. He was the guy who was always the, he was the answer man. He was the guy that ran the Navy during the Second World War, for goodness sake. And suddenly he just falls to pieces like this. And he is clearly concerned for his personal safety at the hands of the people who are supposedly trying to protect him. So he tries to leave the moving vehicle several times and they have to forcibly restrain him. Now we hear from them that he talked of, of suicide. I don't know. Did he really? Who knows? He talked about being a bad Catholic. Um, well, you know, if you want to get technical, he was a bad Catholic. He and his wife did not have much of a marriage to speak of. They each had their affairs. And, um, you know, particularly in the 1940s, that was kind of a big deal, but as particularly if you were a Catholic, I would say. So there was probably guilt on his mind, but still, nonetheless, we don't, I don't really know what Forrestal talked about in the vehicle, except that he tried to get out of it. Um, and we're told that he talked a few times of people who were trying to get him. So, you know, it could be, but it, we don't, we still don't know a lot of this stuff. We do know that he was admitted to Bethesda Hospital under the care of Navy Captain Rains, who I mentioned earlier. And he gives Forrestal a diagnosis. Uh, the diagnosis is called involutional melancholia. Now, I looked this up. Uh, you can look it up. It's got a Wikipedia entry. Uh, this is a, uh, a kind of depressive condition. It is not list, It's not listed in the DSM-5, which is the uh, American Psychiatric Association's kind of standard for their uh, diseases and so forth. It's, so it's not officially recognized as a disease at all. But... Um, but it's out there and people have talked about it. And supposedly um, this is, will affect people upon reaching middle age or older age who see their life as a failure. That's the, the typical statement. Um, again, you think about this with Forrestal. Uh, did he see his life as a failure? How would he have seen his life as a failure? Well, okay, he didn't, he didn't get Truman's confidence. He got fired as Secretary of Defense, sure. But this is also a guy who had a massive uh, career of accomplishment. And, you know, look, in the world of politics, there's always winners and losers and people win. They get kicked out and it happens. And you would think that Forrestal would be able to roll with that. But in any case, he gets diagnosed with this involutional melancholia. And um, so supposedly he's now seeing his life as a failure. I'm not so sure about this. So they get into Bethesda. And Forrestal makes this statement that he, he says, I don't, I'm not expecting to get out of here alive. Like, I, am, I don't expect to leave this place alive. He, he makes this declaration. So that's intense. And then here's something that's even more unusual, particularly I mean, for a suicide a patient anyway, or a suicidal patient, excuse me. Forrestal's medical. The medical staff controlling Forrestal were instructed by the people downtown, as they put it, that's, that is national security, to place Forrestal on the 16th floor suite. It was a VIP suite, but it's the 16th floor. Listen, if someone is really a suicide risk, you're not going to put them on the 16th floor. You know, in the 1940s, it's not like today where, you know, the windows are constructed so that it is impossible really for patient to get out through those windows. Uh, 1940s, it was not the same way. And it was entirely possible to go through some of those windows. And it was absolutely possible to go through the windows, at least one window of the 16th floor, as we'll find out. So they put him up on the highest, the top floor of the building, all right, on orders from national security. Meanwhile, now we're here in early April, 1949. Forsell had personal diaries or diary that he kept. This is a really important thing. I, um, 
I have a copy of his uh, highly edited, very highly edited diaries that were published after he died. But Forrestal's actual diaries were in 15 loose leaf binders, 15 loose leaf binders, okay? Totaling over 3,000 pages. 3,000 pages of writing that Forrestal kept through the war years, through 1946, through 1947, 1948, 1949. 3,000 pages of writing. These diaries were removed from his office at the Pentagon. And guess where they were brought? To the White House. They remained in the White House for the entire year. So <laughs> that gave the White House an opportunity to pick through everything Forrestal knew. What does he know? What is he afraid of? I mean, you can imagine. You've got paranoia upon paranoia upon paranoia, and they're just going through those diaries. Um, what's funny, it's not funny, but it's true, is, uh, is that the White House claimed later, anyway, that Forrestal had, had asked for Truman to take custody of the diaries. Uh, this is absolutely absurd. It's preposterous. I mean, these two men had become political enemies by this time, and it's very hard for me to credit the idea that uh, Forrestal had said, oh yes, I want the president to have access to my very personal political diaries that I've been writing all this time. I mean, when, you know, one thing I didn't even mention is through 1948, Forrestal, um, you know, not only had become alienated from Truman, but he had, he had met privately with uh, Thomas Dewey, who was the Republican candidate. Um, which really was a major political uh, faux pas on Forrestal's account. Like you, look, you're the top, you're the Secretary of Defense of Truman's administration, and you're meeting privately with Dewey. Um, Forrestal was, I mean, in his personal politics, a Republican, and that's fine. But you you can't meet with the opposition here. You're working for Truman, so my point is simply to say that there is no reason for Forrestal ever to want Truman to have his diaries. But the Truman White House grabbed the diaries, no question about it. And so then, then you have Truman uh, very abruptly firing Forrestal for a, a, a replacement, by the way, who wasn't even remotely qualified for the job. He was one of Truman's political cronies who had given a lot of campaign donations, a man named Lewis Johnson. He uh, had no experience in defense at all. Um, but the fact is, Forrestal's diaries had very sensitive information that Truman's people needed to know about. And we can imagine, we can assume that they had uh, quite a lot of time to review Forrestal's diaries during the seven weeks that Forrestal was hospitalized at Bethesda. That's nearly two months. So during Forrestal's first week in this hospital in Bethesda, he uh, was basically just put to sleep. Uh, they gave him sedatives, tranquilizers, and he was just like zombied out. Um, it was almost impossible for anyone to have access to James Forrestal. Um, his wife, he was very estranged from his wife. He, she saw him once. He had two sons. They saw him once. Uh, Sidney Sowers, who is another of the men like Forrestal listed on the MJ-12 documents, visited him once. Sidney Sowers was the first Secretary of the National Security Council. Lewis Johnson, Forrestal's successor at uh, defense, visited him once. Truman visited him once. And a congressman by the name of Lyndon Johnson, who later became president, visited him. Um, it is believed that uh, future President John F. Kennedy may have visited him. And I um, believe I learned this from uh, my friend Peter Robbins, who also has looked into Forrestal. Um, and so we've got that. Uh, manager visited, uh, Dr. Manager visited Forrestal twice. So, so those are the people who saw Forrestal. And I'm not sure about Kennedy, actually. I really want to uh, review that, but 
Um, I know LBJ definitely visited Forrestal, and that's interesting. So here's the thing about Forrestal. He wasn't allowed to see several people that he repeatedly asked to see. His brother, Henry, uh, two priests, and uh, one other friend. None of these people were allowed to see Forrestal. Henry Forrestal, uh, his brother, for example, had repeatedly been trying on his end to see his brother and was refused every single time. They said, nope, sorry, the, the secretary uh, is not able to see you at this time. Henry got so mad. So he uh, threatened to tell the newspapers and he was threatening to sue the hospital. They eventually let him visit his brother. He was actually able to see uh, Forrestal four times. Um, Henry then told uh, Dr. Uh, Rains, he told the hospital's commandant, a guy named Captain uh, B.W. Hogan, that his brother wanted to, that James Forrestal wanted to talk to a very close friend, Monsignor Maurice Sheehy, a priest. Um, so Hogan, who was, who was running things here in the hospital, uh, he said, yes, actually, um, I am aware that your brother, James Forrestal, has requested this several times. Sorry, I'm still not allowing it. Um, in fact, she, he had tried seven times to see James Forrestal. Each time he's told that uh, the timing wasn't good. It wasn't opportune. It was one of the things he was said. It's like, are you kidding me? Um, she was a, a Navy chaplain. So he wasn't just an ordinary Monsignor or priest. He was with the military, got into some very big arguments several times with Reigns and um, his very strong impression that he later recounted to uh, someone writing, um, doing investigation on this. His impression was that Reigns was acting under orders, that Reigns probably wanted to uh, let Forrestal have the visit, but that he wasn't allowed to. There was another priest who was also prevented from seeing Forrestal. His name was Father Paul McNally of Georgetown University. And there was at least one other friend of, of Forrestal's who was not able to see him, and I don't know who that friend was. So you've got a number of people, though, who are close to the secretary, and they are completely barred to visit him. I mean, what kind of hospital prevents a patient from seeing their priest or rabbi or minister or, or their spiritual advisor? And, and repeatedly over a period of almost two months. That's highly unusual. So anyway, Forrestal's at Bethesda now for more than a month, a month and a half. Now we're in mid-May of 1949. And the people, the, the few people who are able to see Forrestal, including his brother, um, are all in agreement that, that James Forrestal was improving, that he seemed fine. Uh, Henry, for example, said that his brother was acting and talking as sanely and as intelligently as any man I've ever known. And so now we're up to May 14th, 1949, and, and Dr. Raines decides he's going to leave Washington in a few days, and he's going to attend a meeting of the American Psychiatric Association. Okay, so he's going to leave on the 18th of May, and he's going to be gone for a while. So after their last meeting, they meet on the morning of, of May 18th and Reigns writes, Forrestal was a little bit, he was somewhat better than he was a week ago. Uh, all through May 20th, all through May 21st, everything that we know about Forrestal is that he was in good spirits. Uh, he had good appetite. He was well-dressed. He was shaved. He had no signs of depression whatsoever. So now I'm going to give you the official account of the death of James Forrestal. We are now on the night of May 21st going into the 22nd. All right. Officially speaking, it's 1.45 in the morning. Forrestal is awake. He is said to be copying down at, in his bed a, a piece of ancient poetry. It's actually a chorus from a play by the great uh, playwright Sophocles, uh, the play known as Ajax. It's a great play, by the way, highly recommend it. 
And he was just copying this down from a book of world literature that was there, some anthology. Um, by the way, so the uh, that's a very, like a lot of Greek tragedies, uh, not what you would call upbeat in emotional tone. Well, you know, so there's always great tragedies that happen in the in those plays. They're brilliant, wonderful plays, but they're they can be depressing. So a Navy corpsman who's guarding Forrestal's room, Forrestal always had a guard outside his door in eight hour shifts. The corpsman guarding Forrestal's room checks in. And that was his job to do every 15 minutes. 45, Forrestal supposedly tells him that he did not want a sedative. The, guy, the corpsman said, would you like a sedative? Forrestal supposedly says, no, uh, I'm gonna stay up and I'm gonna read some more. Now there is a different variation of this story and I just wanna put this out here. This appeared in the New York Times, which reported that Forrestal had been asleep at 1.30 in the morning and then awake at 1.45. So you've got variations here. Anyway, this corpsman reports, uh, he, you know, Forrestal says, no, I'm gonna stay awake. And the corpsman supposedly goes to the psychiatrist, uh, the assistant of Dr. Raines, uh, who's sleeping next door. So the corpsman decides to wake up the psychiatrist who's asleep to say, the secretary doesn't want a sedative. I don't know how unusual that is. It seems a little unusual to me. So to continue, five minutes later, the two of them return to Forrestal's room and they find this room empty. Uh, Reigns' assistant later claimed that Forrestal supposedly had sent the corpsman out on a brief errand. So you've got conflicting stories here. During this time, supposedly, while he was alone in the room, Forrestal walked this, there's this, uh, what's called a diet kitchen across the hall. So a diet kitchen in a hospital is like, well, they'll, there's a little kitchen area where they will prepare special meals for the patient and so forth. So supposedly he walks to this diet kitchen across the hall and ties one end of his bathrobe cord, right? The bathrobe that's around his neck very tightly, one end around to a radiator. That is, let me explain this. So the rate, there's a, a window there and in front of the window is a radiator, you know, for heating the room. So he supposedly tied in the other end of the cord to the radiator. Think about this, all right? Removes this screen, there's a flimsy screen there, and then jumps from the 16th floor. Again, this is all official story here. The cord becomes untied from the radiator and James Forrestal falls to his death after hitting part of the building on the way down. It's rather gruesome. So that's the official account. Now, uh, there are a number of biographies that were done of James Forrestal. It was one from uh, around 1960, uh, another one in the early 1990s. And um, in, in these biographies, I mean, they all discount even the possibility of murder. You know, I mean, we're talking about, this is all polite conversation here among official historians. I, this is the only conclusion I can make. And they call Forrestal's death uh, a, a series of chance events. Okay, so, but here's the thing. You've got major discrepancies, first of all, in the official suicide story. These are never really resolved. And then you've got the fact that everyone who is close to Forrestal seemingly did not believe that this the official story at all. Um, there's, there was a man who wrote uh, an alternate biography of Forrestal. I'm gonna get to that in a minute. His name was Cornell Simpson, a very interesting analysis. But even like the official biographers of Forrestal, like one in the early 1960s, Arnold Rogow, uh, said, it, he admitted like that there were certain details that haven't been made public of Forrestal's death. And definitely there was this acknowledgement that a lot of people did believe Forrestal was murdered. And he, he did acknowledge that Forrestal's death was definitely desired by certain people and groups 
who in 1949 held very great power in the United States. So all of that was kind of acknowledged. But then there's the people who really openly believe that Forrestal was murdered. One of those people who believed it was Forrestal's brother, Henry Forrestal. He believed this very strongly. And Henry said, they murdered him. And who's they? Well, in Henry's opinion, it was either communists or Israeli sympathizers within the government. And let me just mention this whole thing about the Zionist or Israeli connection, because it's important to understand this is not some anti-Semitic uh, claim here. The fact was that geopolitically, Forrestal was not a fan of the formation of uh, uh, sovereign government of Israel. And it wasn't that he was necessarily anti-Jewish. I don't really know if he was or wasn't, but it was true that he was definitely uh, someone who believed in power politics of siding with the guys who owned the oil in the Middle East, and those are uh, Arabs and Muslims, and was absolutely interested in not alienating them. So he wasn't a friend of Israel. And so for that reason, there is this uh, fear that it was either communists or, or Zionist Israeli agents. Definitely communists could have done it. Before there was a Senator Joseph McCarthy, who started the whole thing that we call McCarthyism in the 50s, James Forrestal was very probably the leading, like most public anti-communist person in the United States. That, that's a really definite possibility that he was. So Forrestal had enemies even beyond the Truman White House or from the Air Force. And let me just mention the rivalry between the Air Force and the Navy and the Army and these services under the Secretary of Defense. This is not something to trivialize either. Uh, these services were had only at this time been brought under kind of a, a truly uh, stronger authority, particularly after Forrestal was out, they reorganized the Secretary of Defense so that he had total authority over the services. But <clears throat> You know, the Air Force wasn't happy with Forrestal. The Navy wasn't happy about a whole bunch of things in the uh, government at the time. Navy wanted their own nukes, for example. And there was this thing called the Revolt of the Admirals. And there was a lot of infighting in the United States military hierarchy at this time. A lot of people were very unhappy with each other. Um, so there's definitely room for different machinations and shenanigans and backstabbing to go on. Um, but back to Henry Forrestal and his, his uh, conviction that his brother James was murdered. Henry later said, he said, you know what? The more I was thinking about my brother being shut up at Bethesda, locked in there, denied the right to see Father Sheehy, the more it bothered him. And he decided, Henry Forrestal decided he was going to take James out of the hospital. He was, just gonna, he was going in and he was going to take his brother out come hell or high water. He was going to take him out, take him to the countryside and let him complete his recovery there outside of the Beltway and all the craziness in the Washington, D.C. environment. He made train reservations to go to Washington on May 22nd. He also reserved a room at the Mayflower Hotel for that day. He then phoned the hospital. <laughs> that he was going to arrive on May 22nd and he was going to take his brother and just try to stop me, he said. So we have that whole thing happening. And it just so happens the night before his brother falls, leaps to his death. Hmm. Then there's Father Sheehy. Father Sheehy definitely had reason to suspect murder. Uh, murder. So the morning that Forrestal died, all right, after he learns about this. So he goes to the hospital. There's this huge crowd there, as you could imagine. And this very experienced-looking hospital corpsman approaches Father Sheehy. You have to keep in mind, a lot of people knew who this man was because he had been trying repeatedly and failing seven times to see James Forrestal. So this corpsman comes up to the Monsignor. And in this very low, tense voice, he says, Father, you know Mr. Forrestal didn't kill himself, don't you? She's shocked by this. And before he can even say anything or even ask this guy's name, 
uh, other people in the crowd press in and the, the guy is gone. So, so you've got several other very odd elements concerning the final moments of Forrest Hill. And I want to get into a little bit of this. First, the Navy corpsman who was guarding Forrestal was a new man, a young man named Robert Wayne Harrison Jr. And this is someone that Forrestal had never seen before. And this is really worth pointing out that the regular guard during the midnight shift was supposedly absent without official leave. So the story goes, had gotten drunk the night before. So Harrison was the brought in as a replacement. He is the only person to have had direct contact with Forrestal in the moments before Forrestal's death. And it's only on his word that this whole official count rests. And it's also worth pointing out that Forrestal and this other corpsman that had been replaced, they had actually gotten to become quite close. Um, and and um, they liked each other. And Forrestal had talked to this young a guy who says, look, after I'm out of here, I, can, I, I wouldn't mind hiring you as, as my secretary or in some capacity. Like he really took a liking to him. So that guy is gone. This new guy comes in and Farso goes out the window. Interesting. Um, also, you know, we're told Farso was writing this chorus from Sophocles from the play Ajax. So he not only did he not finish writing out what he was transcribing, he actually stopped in the middle of a word. In the middle of a word. So, and then here's the other thing. Uh, the fact is, this handwriting, it's, this is available, and you can, you can look for this online. To my view of what I have seen of Forrestal's handwriting, this does not look like Forrestal's normal handwriting. It doesn't look like his handwriting at all. Um, I used to study, it's a funny thing, for many years I used to study um, graphology in, on an amateur level. It's handwriting analysis, and uh, it's kind of a fun thing. I got into it from my teen years and did it through uh, uh, many years. I haven't done it in a while, but uh, I, I like looking at handwriting. It's something that uh, just is a personal interest of mine. And Forrestal's normal handwriting is, was small and very vertical, somewhat rounded letters. Uh, the lower loops were, are not, were not particularly long uh, for him. You know, these are certain things that people just do without thinking in their handwriting. The handwriting of the, the poem that Forrestal was transcribing is slanted very definitely toward the right. It's much more angular, and the lower loops are absolutely way longer. Um, now it's possible people can try different handwriting out, but I mean, think about it for yourself. Uh, even if you change the slope of your handwriting, it's very unlikely that you're going to change uh, every other feature of your handwriting. Most people just don't do this. Uh, Forrestal's handwriting, or what we're told was his final piece of writing, looked very radically different from his normal handwriting, in my opinion. So that's very odd, right? Plus, think about this, all right? Forrestal was supposedly asleep at 1.30 in the morning. So how reasonable is it to, to imagine that sometime between 1.30 in the morning and 1.45 in the morning that he wakes up, gets out some writing material, finds this totally depressing poem within this huge anthology, copies out 17 lines, puts on his robe, crosses the hall to this little diet kitchen where he tightly wraps and knotted his bathrobe cord around his neck and clearly tied it very loosely to the radiator under the window and then climbs out of the window uh, and jumps. Uh, I mentioned my, my friend and colleague earlier, Peter Robbins. Um, Peter's written about UFOs. I've known Peter for many years and uh, we're very good friends. And Peter's also looked into the death of James Forrestal on his own. And one thing Peter pointed out uh, in one of Peter's previous jobs years ago is as a suicide hotline volunteer. Very interesting job. And uh, and so he knows a little something about this. And, and the fact is, in talking with medical professionals and looking into this whole thing, uh, not one medical professional 
has ever heard of anyone attempting forest, uh, excuse me, suicide the way that Forrestal supposedly tried it. If you're going to hang yourself, you're going to hang yourself. You know, you can find a, a bar inside a building or in a room. And in fact, there was one in, uh, in the bathroom of Forrestal's hospital room that could conceivably have been strong enough to do it. Uh, if you're going to jump, you jump. Hangers hang themselves, jumpers jump. You don't hang yourself by jumping out of a window. How bizarre is this? So, um, and then you got this very odd juxtaposition. You got this tightly knotted bathrobe cord around his neck and, and this loose tying to the radiator, which immediately comes untied, supposedly, and allows him to fall to his death. Um, and then the, radi the radiator is like two feet long. The top of the radiator was six inches below the windowsill. And it's attached to the wall with its base uh, 15 inches above the floor. I mean, it's just like a weird kind of gallows for someone who wants to hang themselves. Um, but there's actually no evidence that the bathrobe cord had ever been tied to this little radiator in the first place. There's no evidence ever turned up. So if the cord had snapped under Forrestal's weight, you would have still found one end of the, of the bathrobe cord still tied to the radiator, but it wasn't. The cord didn't break, it just, uh, it just was it whole, it was entire with his body, it stayed with his body. And also, and there wasn't a mark on the radiator anyway to indicate that anything had been tied there. And then you have to ask yourself, uh, why would you jump out of a window outside of your room by anchoring yourself to a, anchoring yourself to a radiator? Um, there, there are way easier done so you could have done this. Um, and if you're going to jump, why, why have a cord around your neck? I mean, it's, it, none of this makes sense. Okay, so basically we don't know that the cord was ever tied to the radiator, but we do know that it was tied tightly to Forrestal's neck. Um, here's another thing. Later inspection of outside the windowsill showed scuff marks. Uh, on the windowsill itself and on the cement work outside. So what's that? I mean, clearly this could easily have been Forrestal uh, uh, when he was hanging by the neck from the radiator. Maybe he decided, oh man, I changed my mind. I wanted to climb back in. Um, but actually, and, and that was actually uh, put forth as a theory to explain the scuff marks that Forrestal changed his mind after he just decided to kill himself in this bizarre way. But of course, doesn't it seem a little more logical that they would have been made by someone struggling to stay alive while someone else is pushing them out the window? Yes, I think that's quite a bit more logical. There's other suspicious elements to Forrestal's story. There's the whole decision to put him up on the 16th floor, which was exactly opposite what medical opinion wanted. There was a nearby annex, uh, the, and the bottom floor of this nearby annex was the first choice of what his caretakers actually wanted, but it was pressed by people in Washington. We don't know who they were. All right, so that's one thing. Also, keep in mind, okay, this is 14 years before President John F. Kennedy was assassinated, all right? The investigation of Forrestal's death was a complete and total sham, a total sham. Uh, the hospital labeled his death a suicide even before there was any investigation. How do you do that? The county coroner comes over like in a hurry and he confirms all the statements of the hospital. All right, even in cases where there's a slight possibility of murder, it's, it's normal for a coroner to hold off, to delay signing a death certificate until there's been some kind of investigation or an autopsy, an inquest. None of this happened with a man who had been running the American defense establishment just two months earlier. Um, <laughs> it doesn't seem credible, does it? And since the death happened on a United States Navy uh, piece of property, local police were not able to investigate. 
So instead, you've got the head of the Naval Board of Inquiry immediately announcing that he was absolutely certain that Forrestal's death could only have been a suicide, nothing else. So this is very odd. You know, the um, um, inquest was called the, uh, the Willicutts report was the uh, was headed by a man named Willicutts, and he headed the Navy's investigation all uh, through 1949. Uh, and the transcript of that is available now. It wasn't available, I think, until uh, early 21st century. Uh, but you can you can read it. It's fully available as a PDF. And there's a transcript of their interview with the uh, replacement Navy Corpsman Harrison, which, as far as I can tell, could not have lasted more than 10 minutes. And it was essentially like, well, what's your story? Well, my story is I went to check on him at 145 and he didn't want to take a sedative. So I left the room. I came back. He was gone and out the window. Like, and they just no cross-examination, nothing. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, please be on your way. That's it. Like there's no repercussions that I w was able to see of this in any way from this guy who allowed the former secretary of defense, a man with a lot of secrets to go out that window, 16 floors down. So, so, okay. So it's very obvious, I think, to anyone with a brain inside their head that James Forrestal was pretty certainly murdered, that there is very certainly a cover up about this. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the UFO connection, which I find very particularly intriguing about Forrestal's death, All right? It isn't necessary that Forrestal was, was murdered because of UFOs, but let's talk about a few things here. First of all, Forrestal's position in the defense community made him absolutely the, the guy, the key guy to go to in formulating any policies at all relating to UFOs. All right, obviously there's the president, obviously there's national security advisors and so forth, but look, you're running the defense department. You're going to be on the very, the, the inner circle, right? So that had to be Forrestal. Um, the UFO problem, as I have often called it, was of very great significance to people who were at the top of the national security hierarchy. And we can absolutely recognize that Forrestal also had an interest in this, um, even though all the official biographies and you know, statements about him are generally silent about UFOs. Then you've got Forrestal's concern that he was followed by foreign looking men, as he put it. Now, you know, he never said clearly who he thought was following him, uh, at least not consistently. There, there were other people who assumed he was talking about communist agents or Zionist agents or other Washington insiders. Uh, but people were just assuming. No one really knew. Then you've got this bizarre relationship, this unsettling relationship with the Secretary Air Force, Stuart Symington. Now, I mean, it's yeah, okay, so Symington considered Forrestal to be a political enemy, but you have to ask yourself why. At the moment of Forrestal's departure from politics, all right, he's now out of the picture. Why would Symington take it upon himself to have a secret conversation with Forrestal that clearly seems to have left Forrestal unhinged? This is a little bit beyond your typical political maneuvering, isn't it? You know, what did Symington say to Forrestal? What did Symington do to Forrestal? So let's just say for the sake of argument, we speculate that James Forrestal was murdered. Then we have to ask why. What would have prompted someone in the national security apparatus to plan the death of the former secretary of defense? Okay, so let's look at the Russians, the communists, the Soviets. Could the KGB have done this? Well, there's no evidence. There's nothing that's ever turned up that they were involved. Never. Um, the budget issue, you know, the whole that Forrest had to deal with, with the Secretary of the Air Force and all that. Um, I, I would think absolutely not. That whole matter, the budget was settled by then. Um, then you've got uh, this fellow named Cornell Simpson, who in the 1950s, 
hardcore anti-communist. He writes this by uh, by this book. I, I was going to say biography, but really a book called The Death of James Forrestal. Uh, hardly any copies of this book were ever printed. It took him 10 years to get it published. No one would touch this book. No one in the American publishing industry would touch this book. And um, I have a copy of it. And um, it's really two books in one. The first segment of the book, which is the truly valuable part, in my opinion, is a 40, 45 page detailed, I would say, forensic analysis of Forrestal's death. It's very well put together. I have to say this. The whole rest of the book is this whole like why the communists are out to destroy world civilization. And you can like that or not like that. But it's the detailed analysis that Simpson put together, Cornell Simpson, that is really quite interesting. I had a heck of a time finding this book years ago when I was doing my first analysis of Forrestal's death. Um, in any case, Simpson wrote that, you know, his whole thing was that the communists were the, the real group that probably killed him. Um, and I suppose, you know, it is true. Forrestal was a strong anti-communist and he might have been perceived as a threat uh, for Soviet agents and, I mean, look, the, the Russians and the Soviets were no strangers to the art of staging a, a suicide. No question about it. Of course, neither were the Americans. All right. So both sides could have done it. But then there's UFOs. UFOs are the great hole in our history. You know, we now we're now at a point now in 2018 where I think it is fair to say that there's more and more knowledge and information coming out about UFOs than we had in the past, but nonetheless, it is still absolutely true that in official accounts of our history, what I've often called official reality, as opposed to unofficial reality, in official reality, official truth, UFOs are still absent really from our history. But it's like the ele elephant in the living room that no one ever wants to discuss. It's there, it was a huge presence and I would simply suggest to you that an explanation about Forrestal's death that deals, that centers on UFO, gives a better explanation than any other interpretation that I am aware of for the whole reason that this completely, uh, you know, solid, psychologically strong man seems to have unhinged from this successful, brilliant career into. Um, a state of uh, some psychological trauma, and more importantly, the need to silence someone who could no longer be trusted with a very sensitive secret, all right? And we have to ask ourselves, did James Forrestal learn something about UFOs that contributed to his breakdown and contributed to the need to kill him. Now that he was out of power, becoming a private citizen, this is 1949. This is not today where all kinds of measures are now, I mean, much more clearly in place to um, keep people silent, to keep them quiet after they leave. In 1949, the whole system was not really fully in place. No one really knew what James Forrestal might be up to upon his departure, he was a real security risk, without a doubt. Not to the Israelis, not to the Russians, but to the Americans, to the American national security state that was dealing with the UFO phenomenon, this new, unknown, strange, scary phenomenon that had dropped into their laps, and they were still scrambling with a way of trying to deal with this. All right. So I think you know, the fact is that to this day, we need to recognize that this man, and I, you know, James Forrestal, I'm not saying was uh, some saint or some angel or a great American hero in every way. I'm not a fan of, the, of turning American politicians or officials into saints and heroes after they die. This just happened to John McCain. Are you kidding me? You know? But that's a whole other story for another time. We've done kind of the same thing to Forrestal. The Navy named an air, aircraft carrier after him. And, you know, okay, fine. 
This is what we do to our public officials. We turn them basically into deities. We do it to presidents and we do it to other powerful public officials who, who are important to the American national security establishment. But the fact is when you pull behind the curtain and you look to see what's actually going on, uh, there are definite powerful reasons to have killed James Forrestal and those reasons absolutely could have included a connection, a viable connection to the UFO phenomenon. With that, I'm gonna end this presentation for you and maybe I can bring my wife, Tracy Garba Dolan in to join me for the <laughs> final few minutes that we have here. What do you think? Okay, my sounds dear. good. I'm gonna, I'll, uh, I'm gonna move over for you and we'll have, we'll share the screen here. Okay. So yes. how was that? Oh, it was wonderful. All right. I think we all enjoyed that very much. And, uh, you know, number one thing, why hasn't this become a movie? <laughs> I mean, it, it should, has, this should be a movie, right? It has every it element. Absolutely should be a movie. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah it's crazy stuff. Well, so, I mean, the, the reason it's not a movie, I mean, let's answer that. Yeah. Hollywood is infiltrated by the CIA, has been for years. Uh, and we know this now, you know, there is a Chase, Chase Brandon uh, who came out as the CIA's Hollywood liaison. And we know mm -hmm. that the CIA has coordinated with Hollywood on dozens, I think actually hundreds of military movies to provide their spin on what Hollywood puts out. So do I, we really think that the CIA is going to put out this story? No. On James <laughs> I ser seriously doubt that. So I think that answers the question. Right. We could make an independent non-Hollywood movie. That would be interesting and see how that works. That would be cool. I wish somebody would do that. Yeah. Uh, so do you want to take a couple questions? It's, uh, it's yeah, been an hour to. and 15. Okay. This is actually a lot longer than I thought. Of. I, I was actually expecting uh, 40, 40 minutes, 45 minutes at the most. And I went for, it uh, looks like 70 minutes, 75 minutes. But you know what? It, I think um, it was really nice because uh, to be very thorough about this case, because there are so many interesting details. There's actually a couple of that I, that I mentioned. Let me just, uh, that I forgot. And I would mention uh, in Forrestal's room, uh, and this I learned from Peter, Peter Robbins, um, who uh, at, you know did a detailed analysis. This is in the Willicutt's report. Um, there are photographs of Forrestal's room, and you can look at these forest, photographs. I remember seeing them. There's broken glass on the floor. Yes. All right, so what, what's that all about? Mm -hmm. Why is there broken glass on the floor of his room? Right, and wasn't there something about the time of day that was unusual as well? Do you recall that? Well, um, in the photos, the photos were taken. There is a lot of daylight in the photographs. There was mm -hmm. a lot of light, so clearly they waited. Um, these these photographs are not taken early. They were not taken immediately. They were taken mm -hmm. uh, well into the morning. Uh, Forrestal's after his death, which is you're talking like eight hours or so, seven, six, seven, eight hours, at least six hours after right. he died. Um, so there was a lot of time to clean the room up. Well, and, you know, but there's, someone forgot there was a little bit of glass on the floor. Well, that's what was so interesting too. When you look at the pictures, so only a few hours later, so I don't know if it was six, fine. The but room- it, it, it had to have at least, he died officially at 1.45 in the morning. We're in May. Uh, you know, it starts getting light. We'll, we'll give them benefit of the doubt. We can look at maybe 630 in the morning. So you're talking a good five hours. Okay. Well, I remember seeing the pictures, uh, you know, obviously if there's a crime scene or even a suicide, usually they'll have the room cordoned off. Nobody can go in. They won't want to touch any of the, uh, items in the room because there's an investigation. Right. So Peter pointed out that the room, and we saw these pictures, right. was absolutely sterilized. There was no, yes. there were no personal belongings. That's absolutely right. everything was removed. Everything was touched. It was completely empty and sterile. It's like it's like those guys yeah. on the Pentagon lawn after 9-11 picking up all the pieces. Yeah. These guys in black suits and sunglasses, just like, which they did. Uh, just clean up the crime scene. And this is what they did. I'm glad you mentioned that. Well, it just, I, you know, you were talking about photos and then I just I can see them in my mind I mean I remember that was so unusual yeah seeing them and then the room was totally cleaned out so it made it even more unusual that there was glass on the rug yeah. that's the Someone, only thing they, that was there they forgot something yeah they weren't perfect yeah so it was fascinating 
So uh, I just have a quick uh, couple questions here. So right. is it true that there were two missing Forrestal diaries? Do you know? Are you aware? I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, what, what, what you can definitely say is, look, Forrestal is known to have kept a massive diary. All right. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the real diary. Right. He kept a, it was 3,000 pages, we're told. 15 loose leaf binders is a lot. Um, what we have, I have downstairs in my office, actually, the, the Forrestal Diaries. These were published shortly after he died. Um, and it's like, a, I don't know, maybe a 400-page book at the most, 300-page something. So it's uh, highly edited. Oh. You know, it's highly, highly, yeah. it's like cleaned up. Just like right. his room was yeah. after he was murdered, right. so were his diaries cleaned up and expunged. So maybe that's what the the person who asked the question meant. I don't know what other um, other two diaries we're talking about. There's definitely the official real diary and then the official diary. Right, of course. So, so I think this person, it's Tarka Jedi here, um, was reaching to see if they were missing. Could, could he have left them in Florida, hidden them somewhere? Oh, them. well, I wouldn't think so, only because he, they go so quickly from like, you know, he has this kind of breakdown after he gets out of the car with Symington, goes in his office staring at the wall, you are a loyal fellow, you are a yeah, loyal that's fellow. Crazy. Like, that's that's a movie scene right there. Yeah, right? I know, that, um, that's haunting. He's home haunting. for one day, one day. And the national security team basically takes him and flies him to Florida. So I would doubt that. I mean, okay. he didn't have anything. I don't think he had a house there. They they went down to Florida. Truman was a big fan of going down there. Truman would wear these big Hawaiian shirts. And there's a picture of the two of them in Florida uh, at one point during some yeah. downtime. So there was obviously a place there. But I don't think Forrest would have been able to grab any of his important personal belongings. Right. Okay. And I don't think he would have wanted to. Like, he's surrounded basically by the enemy. He knew this when he's going down. Like, he right. clearly had an idea that he was, <laughs> I'm not going to get out of this place yeah. alive, as he said. Right. So, yeah, that would have been interesting. I mean, I like where this person was going with their questions, you know, because their third question was, is, is it possible they kept him locked up for so long trying to get their location? Like, if, if he had left diaries, um, Right. You know, um, well, I believe interesting thinking there. If I read, uh, if I remember what I read years ago correctly, I, I had thought his diaries were actually in his Pentagon office. Um, okay. I could be wrong, or they could have been, in a, could have been at his home. Um, but in any case, I don't think that they would have been in Florida. Right. I don't think so. Okay. Any other interesting questions? Uh, well, people were suggesting that. Uh, him being hung outside of the window was must have been a message uh, to the cabal, you know, like don't mess with us. Because why, like you were saying, like why would you go to all that trouble to hang yourself? Why don't you just jump out the window, right? Yeah, it actually, it's a very con. Well, I think this is what I think actually happened. Uh, it doesn't have to have been the Navy corpsman who was on duty. By the way, I got a, a very angry email from a, uh, I think the grandson of that corpsman years ago. He was many I, years ago, who got very angry that I implied that this man, Robert Harrison, was implicated in the in the death of Forrestal. And right. look, I wasn't trying to impl imply that anyone did it, but the facts the facts are facts, right? right? So it's very suspicious. But it does, he doesn't have to have been the murderer. You know, like he could have just been there, told, "All right, now get that get out," and some other people come in. And what? How do you silence someone like Forrestal? You go in, you tie something around his neck, real tight. So he can't yell, he can't scream, oh, that? he can't resist. Mm -hmm. And you grab him and you throw him out the window. Yeah. Like that's the easiest thing to do. James Forrestal, when he was a younger man, was a good athlete. He was a tough guy. Mm -hmm. he, he was a boxer. Right. He was an amateur boxer. Um, but at this point, he's in his late 50s, mid 50s. He wasn't a big man. And he was definitely not as powerful by a, a long stretch as he could have been, you, you know, a couple of big guys, tough guys coming in could easily, easily subdue him, tie a cord around his neck, throw him out of a window, which right. I think, or push him out of the window, uh, which I think is what actually happened. And he's fighting yeah. to stay back in, in the building. I, I think that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. So do you think he was a victim of MK Ultra? Well, MK Ultra, you mean MJ-12? MK Ultra is the mind control. Program. That's what I meant. Oh. 
Uh, actually, that is what I meant. Well, I mean, here's the reality. The U.S. Navy at that time was uh, op had a couple of mind control programs going. One that I know of was called Pro Project Chatter. In fact, you know, part of that was run very close by to us out of the University of Rochester. They participated. The, the U of R, as we call it, they've got their own long-standing connection. I didn't know that. Not to national security elite. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that was Project Chatter. U.S. Navy ran, I mean, it wasn't only the University of Rochester. No, I'm but, sure that it was a lot of places but it was that a, we don't know about. it was a mind control program, yeah. And actually, um, you know, it's funny. Why would I have not have, like, just gone to that? Because here's Forrestal, who's just falling to pieces yeah. to all those people who knew him. Mind control programs were going on and they were happening to unwitting people at the same time. There was a man, famous man, who also went out of a big uh, hotel building, the 10th floor of the Statler Hotel in New York. His name was Frank Olson. Mm -hmm. Frank Olson, just like a year or two after Forrestal, was slipped some LSD in his, in his uh, uh, brandy. Uh, with some CIA people. Frank Olson was oh, a specialist in biological warfare, chemical chemical weapons and bio warfare. And uh, he was well known to people in CIA. CIA people, you know, as pranks, this is really true, would drop acid I've heard on this. others and watch them trip. Can you imagine? <laughs> Long before the 60s, guys, the CIA had, had uh, people within there who were experts at tripping on acid, on yeah, LSD. So they give Frank Olson some LSD in his drink, and Olsen has a really bad trip. This is around the same time as, you know, Forrestal. And uh, Olsen was really messed up. They ended up taking him out as well. I mean, he had family, he had wife, kids. They take him to New York to some quack doctor, and supposedly he's on the 10th floor of this hotel in New York, and according to the big tough guy who was there to guard him, Olsen just runs like a running back football player out this window to his death. Like, sorry, not buying that one either. In right. fact, uh, that that one got some uh, justice for the family. Many years later, like 25, 30 years later, they got a, a couple hundred thousand dollars settlement from the CIA. I mean, not nearly enough. Yeah. But the fact was that the greater point is that mind control types. I mean, LSD, for example, was very intimately involved in MK Ultra. As part mm -hmm. of the whole thing, and you've got LSD tests, experiments, uh, pranks happening to people. So yeah, I mean, actually looking at Forrestal from that point of view, um, at the very least, we've got a form of psychological warfare going against them from mm -hmm. the Air Force through the media, and I would have to say, I think I could not rule out some kind of. Um, attempt to destabilize him psychologically right. by enemies. That may not have been authorized from the very top. Mm -hmm. Who knows? I mean, you're, ta you're talking about a labyrinth within the American national security yeah. uh, establishment. I mean, <clears throat> all of these competing interests. It's not all like, oh, the president makes his decision and goes down the chain. Not really. It doesn't right. work like that all the time. So Forrestal could have had enemies who really were uh, messing with him psychologically to destabilize him. Okay. And someone asked, and I wasn't sure, I didn't hear whether you answered this, uh, if he was a part of MJ-12. So that was... He was. In fact, he, he was, was listed as MJ, was. MJ-3. They all had numbers. Okay. Now, the MJ, uh, <clears throat> you know, 12 document, excuse me, everyone likes to argue about MJ-12. Was it real or is the document fake? Uh, everyone's got an opinion. I've been pretty open for many, many years that I generally credit the MJ-12 documents and the successor documents, the so-called majestic documents that are on the website of Bob and Ryan Wood. Um, I'm not saying all of the majestic documents are legit. I don't know. There's arguments against some of them, but I, I overall, I credit them uh, just as I credit the MJ-12 docs. Doesn't mean that the MJ-12 documents were the only version, the only copy of such documents. Who knows? There could have been other versions of documents floating around within the uh, national security uh, community. They could have come from the disinfo people. We're talking Richard Doty and the folks at in, uh, Kirtland Air Force Base. That is a possibility. Does that mean that they're a total fabrication? This is what people have to understand. Disinformation 
is not the same as lies and fabrication. Disinformation could actually literally be putting totally true information out there, but you put it out in a way that makes it easy for people to deny it and to discredit it. And actually, that's the best form of disinformation. Right. You take something that's totally true and you release it in such a way that people inevitably chip away at it and make it seem not believable. That's like an inoculation right. from the truth. So I, for a lot of reasons, I, I think that the MJ-12 documents are worth uh, crediting. And according to that, uh, Forrestal was one of the MJ-12 members. Okay. And um, this might be the last one. Ancient Knowledge asked, if we know disinformation is real, then how can we <laughs> always rely on government documents pulled from FOIA? Well, it's a good question. It's a fair question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as an archaeologist would say, you need to know where a find is in situ. That is where it's found, right? So where is where is the bone found? Where you've got to know all this. What layer, what level, and what location. It's the same with documents. Like you got to know where does a document come from. Uh, particularly in the 1970s, uh, during the glory era of the UFO documents coming out through Freedom of Information, uh, I would say just knowing the backstory of how these documents came out, you're talking like people like Dr. Bruce McAbee issuing FOIA requests, uh, attorney Peter Gersten, researcher named Robert Todd, a bunch of others. Uh, the way that we know these most of these documents came out at that time, I think it's fair to credit them. Um, they came from different branches within the service, uh, within, excuse me, national security. There's a certain uh, common, you know, thread that they have relating to UFOs, but you've got a variety of different branches, Navy, Army, Air Force, CIA, uh, different typefaces. These are all legitimate uh, for their period and so forth. So I think, and plus they're in the U.S. National Archives system. Right. You know, which is a very, uh, a very, um, I guess I would say, professional system. That doesn't mean that fake documents can't be planted, but I don't think it's as easy as as people think. So, um, I've not had any any reason to think that the vast bulk of documents that come through FOIA are to be um, dismissed. Now, okay. uh, leaked documents like the majestic documents or mj12 that's a different thing altogether because okay. they don't have the provenance like they're not from the national archives okay by and large so those you can dispute them okay yeah that's a whole interesting dispute isn't it right i love to hear about that just because the document leaks doesn't make it uh illegitimate either mm -hmm. you know you, you've got to really do some study like this is a whole other topic we should really mm -hmm. do this for a separate Intelligent disclosure. I should do an interview, maybe with um, maybe with Ryan Wood or Stan Friedman or Nick Redfern um, or other people. Bob Wood, people who really know documents. Uh, there's reasons Greenwald. to John Greenwald. Absolutely, absolutely, John Greenwald. Yeah. So there's good. people who know these documents who could really speak to why we should credit most documents through FOIA, and what is it about the leaked documents that we should find credible or not find credible? Right. Uh, th those are long, long debates I could take days and weeks and months and years. Okay. So it's been an hour and a half. You know, it's funny. <laughs> I was, I was, I was, I was going to make this our shortest he was intelligent saying that. disclosure. He said it's going to be short it's, tonight. It's the gonna, longest. <laughs> it's the longest. But I knew, uh, you know, this is such a fascinating story. Again, it really so is. many uh, intricate details that need to be considered. Completely agree. And so, it's fascinated me right from mm -hmm. the beginning of my interest in this subject. It's never gone away. Farsal himself is an interesting man, interesting person. Um, flawed, absolutely flawed, but it's hard not to have a, have some sympathy for him yeah. toward the end of all this. And you see this guy who's surrounded by enemies, who is at the center of a power struggle, and he loses. Yeah, and he pays with his sad. life. Mm -hmm. Pays with his life, and and you know, then the whitewashing that follows is is just as tragic as the actual death of this man. Mm -hmm. Well, right. with that, um, I hope everyone's enjoyed this. I just want to thank those of you who are supporting my work and our work on our website. Um, with your support by joining our site, for example, Richard Dolan members. We're very grateful for that. By providing help uh, or support tonight with your super chats, 
very much appreciate that as well. I just want you to know, um, we do this full time. I don't do anything else. Uh, I work full time in this field as a researcher of the UFO phenomenon and alternative history. And to do that, uh, it helps tremendously to get support uh, from people like yourself who believe in, in what I'm doing and who believe in what we're doing as a team to get this information out. So I just want to thank all of you who have uh, supported us in that way. I agree. And we want to thank everyone for showing up and uh, for the great comments. There was a great chat going tonight. Uh, wonderful questions. Again, we log a lot of the questions, so we'll we'll bring them back out whenever we can. This just happened to go very long, and uh, but it yeah. was very good. And for those of you so, who are members of Richard Owen members, I just want yes, to mention. Yes, we have some members here um, who are on today. Yeah, I want to say hi to all of you, but uh, I just want to let you guys know uh, I'm going to be uh, putting up uh, uh, another answer forum. We do this every now and then. So we've collected a lot of questions from people who are members of the site. And I'll be posting uh, a video. I may not do it live, but I'll, I'll record it and put it up on Richard Owen members, for members uh, to answer your particular questions. We've got a large collection of them that have built up. So I'm going to take care of that. Yep. So I just right. want to say if uh, one easy way to support Richard's research is to subscribe to his YouTube channel. And if you want notifications so you know when the live shows are going, because we do now try to get two out a week. And uh, so if you want those notifications, just uh, hit the bell beside the subscribe button and uh, they will come in your inbox. And uh, anything else? We've got richarddolanmembers.com. There's free stuff there. Then we have some members content as well. That's where our main calendar is. Uh, we also have Richard Dolan Press. And if you want to just remind them who uh, uh, Bruce Maccabee was one of your authors who recently published oh, yeah. a new book. Bruce published a book called uh, 1952 Year of the UFO. Great book. Uh, a very excellent study of that very important year of UFO activity. It uh, sometimes gets forgotten. Um, as we move forward into the future, but 1952 was a tremendous year, and Bruce yeah. wrote a, a very excellent study of that. It's worth reading. So we want to thank all of you so much for being here tonight. We want to thank Michael and Lori, and we look forward to seeing you in a few days. Yes, indeed. And next week. Um, yeah, on Saturday I intend to do another episode of UFOs: The Big Picture. Which, by the way, I just I'll mention this very quickly. My dream had been to create like some really nicely produced five to 10 minute short mm -hmm. things on, on the UFO subject, just to kind of give an overview. And until I really, until we get like a, <laughs> we don't really have a great production studio here. And, and I yeah. don't have the ability to create really highly produced UFO videos. It's I would one of love, our goals. One would of our love goals. to do it. Yeah. It is one of them, but mm -hmm. it can't, I can't do it. So I thought, you know, we're just going to, I'm going to do this. So UFO is the big picture is kind of, uh, I want to make short videos every Saturday. I didn't get a chance to do it this Saturday. We were traveling, but we'll be back again to do uh, five to 10 minute down and dirty. What's it all about, about any particular aspect of the UFO phenomenon. So you can look for that again this Saturday. Yep. All right. Yeah. I think that's it. That's great. Thank you all. Yes. Thank it's you. It's been a pleasure. Have a great night. Good night.